Hello, my name is Caleb Gonzalez, and I'm a PhD student of Rhetoric, Composition, and Literacy in the Department of English at The Ohio State University. The title of my paper and presentation is on reframing the pedagogical frameworks for multilingual inclusivity, socially just, and anti-racist creative writing workshops. This work arises from a particular workshop during my MFA program where code switching between English and Spanish in the work I presented was widely rejected for its particular presence of Spanish. I rely on the work of Gloria Anzaldúa, who writes that for a people who are neither Spanish nor live in a country in which Spanish is the first language, for a people who live in a country in which English is the reigning tongue, but who are not Anglo, for a people who cannot entirely identify with either standard Spanish nor standard English, what recourse is left to them but to create their own language? This became the foundation for my work regarding creative writing studies, language diversity, anti-racist pedagogies, and practices of cultural sustainability. Here are some questions that shape my inquiry. And I wanna highlight the last question here. How is the work of writers of color, included, including bilingual writers, taken up within the creative writing workshop? And why does this conversation still matter? The traditional workshop model has been a significant discussion in creative writing studies. And I use Diane Donnelly's definition of a form that shares and comments on work by teacher and student readers with varying rules of operation, including the silence of the author. In her edited collection, Donnelly discusses a survey she completed before 2010. She found that after serving 167 creative writing teachers across 174 undergraduate creative writing programs, that 51% of the teachers use a model that is similar to the basic uh, workshop. She also notes that 39.2% practice a variation of the mode of instruction and only 10% vary their workshop model. Donnelly later notes that creative writing programs still rely on the tradition of the workshop, referencing the surveys of Edward Delaney, David Starkey, and Wendy Bishop. Like Donnelly, I take interest in what might be gained by flexing the workshop's elasticity. But I'm also interested in what's lost if we do not continue to question, reframe, expand and reconsider the creative writing pedagogies that often emerge from traditional models, including those that exclude the literacies, uh, languages, identities, and work of writers of color. I wonder what might be gained in continuing to reframe the terrain of the creative writing workshop during a crucial time where anti-racist pedagogies and a call for inclusion of code meshing practices, language diversity, and equity are part of what it means to include, sustain, value, and support the work in the advancement of writers of color. So while my focus is on creative writing workshop pedagogies, there is also much at stake for creative writing programs as colleges and universities experience increases in diverse student enrollment and international student enrollment. In fact, Kazima Lee affirms that a diverse and creative writing classroom is vital to the success of that classroom, as well as a part of addressing larger social and political issues surrounding race. Considering that greater context, it's impossible to divorce larger political, social, cultural, and historical context when thinking about the exigency of addressing issues surrounding race, racism, and linguistic racism. And it's significant to note that at a time where the English only movement carries a long history and is ever present in the United States, it's not an exceptional experience that languages and literacies outside of standardized English practices can be pushed aside, critiqued, or given very little feedback, if any at all. They might be problematized as unclear and or framed as deficit or not up to par. For example, in his essay published in AWP, David Murrah 
includes the story of his black friend's first MFA poetry class and how the professor took them aside and recommended the English Remedial Center as an instructional resource. Murrah later writes that when the student told the professor in their poetry, or that their poetry is in black English vernacular, the professor's response was that if the writer continued to write in that way, they were sure never to be published. Here, it's important to note that not only did the professor impose a deficit writing identity, which was mobilized to attempt to erase the writer's language and literacy practice from the group, the professor enforced a dominant narrative of what literary writing should be and how it is taken up linguistically within the publishing industry. Francisco Aragon's essay in The Racial Imaginary highlights such practices beyond the classroom. He recalls being an editor and observing how book reviewers declined to take on poetry books written by Latinx authors. This is significant because MFA programs often mirror the publishing industry. This signals a need to potentially examine with students the structures of power that make up the publishing industry and also how the publishing industry might be changing in ways. For example, the work that I submitted in the workshop I speak of today was later published by a travel magazine after a few revisions which did not include erasing the Spanish that my peers suggested. In fact, the editor saw it as an asset to the piece. Okay, so thus far, I've covered the questions that shape my inquiry about race, linguistic racism in the creative writing workshop. Through the valuable work of other writers, I've affirmed the importance of a diverse creative writing classroom as crucial to the success of the class. I've also discussed a few trends that have been present in the creative writing workshop and in pedagogies. So I wanna provide examples of how writers have recentered and repositioned the work of writers of color as primary texts within their courses. Getting a picture of what teachers of the creative writing workshop are already doing can provide deeper insight as to the need for pedagogies that support anti-racist, inclusive, and culturally sustaining frameworks, which is where I'll end. So it's not a coincidence that in a place of deeply rooted racial tensions, writers of color have felt increasingly left out of the creative writing classroom. And I'm referring here to writers such as Juno Diaz, Jennifer Chang, Ayana Mathis, Bushra Raymond, Esmeralda Santiago, Ari Banias, Miriam Afak, Lan Samantha Chang, Sandra Cisneros, Joy Harjo, David Mura, and the writers of our MFA experiences in the Accentos Review, among many others. For example, Joy Harjo and Sandra Cisneros have discussed being last to be workshopped or finding their work at the bottom of the pile. And this is a trend that is historically rooted and continues to today. It's not a coincidence that in a literary canon where the work of white writers is still the majority, the framework of a literary life and a literary writing style continues to foreground the perspectives and experiences of a white majority. This has had implications upon how writers of color navigate the creative writing curriculum. For example, in her essay, Racial and Ethnic Justice in the Creative Writing Course, Joy Castro, who mentions not being maltreated in the classroom, does discuss devouring on her own the writers of the Latinx. This can often be the case for writers of color who see very little to no writers who look like them on the syllabus. There can sometimes be extra labor to developing creative writing skills of narrative and technique outside of the classroom. This shows that it continues to matter that we examine what's included on course syllabi. And here I refer to the work of Kazim Ali. It continues to matter that when we incorporate the work of writers of color that we ask how their work is represented and what that work brings to our understanding of writing. It also matters that we examine how their work reframes the ways in which we talk about writing and how it reframes the ways in which we talk about issues through the means of story. 
It continues to matter that we ask how the work challenges or disrupts dominant ideologies and writing tropes that position characters of color on the margins. Writers can benefit not only from conversations of representation, but what that means for how we think about creative writing and how we think about our own work. Expanding pedagogical frameworks within the field can provide for a more robust conversation of, of works and the implication for framing that work, the work by writers of color, as primary text within our classrooms. Ari Banias' piece in The Racial Imaginary provides compelling insight to some of the gains that have been made, but also how those gains have been repositioned to sustain dominant frameworks. Banias states, although some gains have been made historically in fights for ethnic studies programs and inclusive curricula, these are always still under attack. And the traditions, histories, criticisms, and experiences and work of poets of color when it does appear alongside the canon or in creative writing curriculum is still overwhelmingly presented as secondary and topical. Banias goes on to say that this work has not received as much time and attention and is often treated as a specialization or afterthought. It is often positioned in the background of creative writing knowledge. A crucial question that I'm asking here is what might this mean for not only the works we include in our teaching, but how we frame, position, and value such works within our teaching. There are examples of creative writing pedagogies that have emerged in intentionally welcoming writers of color, countering issues of exclusion and linguistic racism in the class, and carefully scaffolding the workshop through strategies that other fields provide. And here I'm thinking of uh, rhetoric and composition. So for example, Joy Castro discusses her intentionality by reframing workshop learning um, through, by centering texts um, from writers of color. So she establishes as the primary text, Luna Luna, creative writing ideas from Spanish, Latin American, and Latino literature. And it's edited by Julio Marsan. Castro discusses a reframing of the workshop model through the Latinx influenced Macondo workshop. She explains how this is a way of collectively developing a compassionate code of conduct that foregrounds rules for a sane, kind, and respectful workshop experience. Additionally, the work of Janelle Adsit uh, provides rhetorical strategies that include encouraging and even requiring students to contextualize their writing through a beginning note to the class. And such notes can also identify feedback students might want from the class. Additionally, the critical creative writing resource page provides a number of pedagogical materials for beginning conversations of racial privilege in the creative writing workshop. And you can refer to my bibliography for pedagogical resources related to that through um, Janelle's Janelle's work. Lastly, and more broadly, I'll mention Culturally Sustaining Pedagogies, an edited collection by Django Paris and H. Sammy Ali. Such, pedago such pedagogies are relevant and impactful because they challenge deficit models of learning, um, especially among students of color. For example, culturally sustaining pedagogies begins with the knowledge that languages, literacies, uh, histories, and cultural ways of being as people and communities of color is not pathological. According to Ibram X. Kendi, this knowledge allows us communities of color to see the fallacy of measuring ourselves and the young people in our communities solely against white middle-class norms of knowing and being that continue to dominate notions of educational achievement. Culturally sustaining pedagogies recognizes the traditions, literacies, languages, and epistemologies so the incomes that writers bring, which are rich in knowledge and rooted in lived experience. By expanding creative writing pedagogies to sustain, add to, and support the advancement of writers of color, I think we can continue to work towards pedagogical frameworks of anti-racism, inclusion, equity, and cultural sustainability. Thank you.